This video presents three different examples that give an overview of how to do problems involving static equilibrium that uses both forces and torques. It mainly introduces how you draw and use free body diagrams along with torque. It assumes you're familiar with using torque equals RF sine theta to calculate the torque as described in another video. The first example is actually the third one in the textbook. I prefer this one because it's sort of like other horizontal beam problems that we encounter but has a force, a tension force, that's being applied in a different location than some of the examples I use in class. This is an arm holding a very small pumpkin being held up by the muscle force provided by the biceps, which is actually a tension force. It's constrained by the elbow, which keeps the forearm from moving sideways or up and down at the left end. That's our first task. Identify the forces acting in the problem, the tension force in the muscle, and the environment, gravity acting on the arm and the pumpkin and the elbow. We replace the arm with a free body, which is a rectangular shape that's convenient for this particular problem. We replace the elbow, the constraint with the elbow, with some forces. This shows the free body diagram without any details, that it's been freed from all of the other constraints in the problem so that the elbow forces replace the effect of the elbow and gravity and the muscle act on that little bar representing the arm. So the arm has been replaced by a simple object, the environment is replaced by forces, and there's an axis been chosen at the left hand edge to eliminate the elbow force from the problem. The full diagram, of course, includes variables and dimensions so that we can do our calculation. I want to point out that this diagram from the textbook example shows the actual direction of the elbow force rather than the unknown components that I prefer to use when solving a problem. We then use net torque about that axis to solve for the tension in the muscle in terms of the gravitational torques produced by the weight of the arm and the weight of the pumpkin. I've shown on this picture the way in which we will find the angles, the way in which the angles are defined for doing RF sine theta. In the next picture, I've isolated those so we can see just the counterclockwise torque due to the tension with the lever arm R, the tension force capital T, and the angle phi from the extension of R towards the force T. So we do from R towards the tension, that counterclockwise angle phi then tells us we have a counterclockwise torque. However, because the sine of phi equals the sine of theta, we just do RT sine theta when we do the actual calculation. Gravity, we can see, is a clockwise torque because the angle from the extension of R towards the force of gravity is 90 degrees clockwise. And of course, RMG times the sine of 90 is just R times MG, the force times the lever arm. We include both torques from gravity. Those two clockwise torques determine the counterclockwise torque, which determines the tension. We can then use net force equals zero to find the remaining unknowns. We first turn the tension from an angled force into one that has vertical and horizontal components, and then we can use the net y forces equals zero and the net x forces equals zero to solve for the unknown force components at the elbow. When we do this, the y component will be negative, as shown in the textbook example. The reason that force, the y component, has to be negative is in order for the torques to net out properly if I take the axis at the place where the muscle force acts. That's one of the details that I explain in class. Second example is a simpler problem involving a hanging horizontal beam. It's taken from problem 36 in, the ch in chapter 12. Here we've got a tension in a cable that's holding up the beam that's holding the sign. The angle in this case is defined from H and L, the 2.3 meter length of that pole, by using trig. We introduce a free body, which is again a rectangular shape there that just replaces everything else in the problem, and show the forces due to the environment, the red arrow indicating the gravitational force on the beam, and the blue arrows indicating the force that will replace the wall. When we remove the environment, remove the wall, we then got just the tension force, the two forces at the wall, and mg. We again choose our axis at the left end to eliminate those two unknown force components at the left 
so we can use the torque from the known gravity to solve for the unknown tension. This shows how that's done, same as before. We've got now L from the axis to where the tension force acts, an angle phi that's from that direction back towards the tension, that's counterclockwise, and we calculate LT sine phi by just doing LT sine theta because the sine of theta equals the sine of phi. The clockwise torque is just due to gravity, it will be L over 2 times mg because the force of gravity is acting at the center of mass, which is at the physical center of that beam and of the sign for this particular simple problem. We then solve torque counterclockwise equals torque clockwise, determine the tension, and then use net force equals zero to find the remaining unknowns. Again, you break the tension up into its two components and require that the vertical components balance out and that the horizontal components balance out. And this problem actually is pretty simple. Even though the answer is not in the back of the book, you ought to be able to do this problem on your own. My final example is example two in the textbook, which is a standard ladder problem. This is a ladder leaning against a house. The environment includes a smooth wall and the floor, plus gravity, of course. Earth's force of gravity acts on the ladder. We replace the smooth wall with a force perpendicular to the wall, what's called N2 in this particular example, although I personally prefer to call it just F wall. We replace the floor with a normal force and friction. Sometimes we might give those different names, but many of the problems are going to be built around a normal force and friction, which is equal to mu times the normal force there on the ground. Our axis is chosen to eliminate the two forces due to the floor. Even if, I want to emphasize this, even if the unknown we want to find is the force of friction at the ground, the way we find it is put the axis at the bottom, eliminate the force of friction from the torque problem, use torque to find the force of the wall up there at the top, and it's equal to the force of friction at the bottom because those are the only horizontal forces. It's much easier to eliminate the forces on the floor and then go back and find the forces you want to find that are unknown. The torque due to the wall is L times N2 times the sine of the angle that I call phi that goes from the green dashed line back towards the force. Unfortunately, the author used phi for the angle between the ladder and the floor, so I can't really call it that, but we do L times the normal force there on the wall times the angle phi, which happens to be the angle between the ladder and the floor. Torque due to gravity is clockwise. Here, the angle between L over 2, actually, and the force of gravity is 90 minus the angle of the ladder. And so we'll use the lever arm L over 2 times mg times the sine of 90 minus phi. Solve torques counterclockwise equal torques clockwise. Determine the force due to the wall from the force of gravity. Then use net forces equal zero to find the vertical force from the floor. These are problems that I work in class. This is not really meant to replace what I do in class, but merely provide a review example using examples and problems and figures taken from our textbook.